Without a doubt, there is so much emotion, so much atmosphere, so much direction in this chapter alone that really puts in perspective the finale of the story, right? With under two years remaining, we are really kind of closing in bit by bit the walls that help kind of shape and give us a, a better perspective on what to expect from the finale, right? We are in the final stretch of the story and we're really getting a lot of information, which really helps you build a lot of different ideas. The first biggest thing that I found really impressive about this chapter that I kind of want to touch on is kind of just the overall scale of everything. Like, this is all-out warfare, obviously. This could potentially be the last time we see something of this caliber. As much as this kind of seemed like the kind of pre-war before the final war, the way it's kind of interlocking into some very big monumental moments regarding the rumbling, regarding the world nations collective and confiding within Mali's state, there's a lot of intricate parts that are kind of just spinning around at the moment and interlocking one at a time. Originally, this being the pre-war is slowly turning into the big final war. Seeing the kind of scale of it, seeing all of these dropships kind of burning throughout the sky and crashing uh, into all of these buildings, seeing Yelena, who was captured very beautifully, mind you, just kind of looking up in the sky and raveling and enjoying this all-out slaughter for Marley's dropships. A very good insight to her character. It shows a very warped persona. Even though we haven't seen all too much of Yelena, I think the absolute admiration and respect she has for Zeke specifically is one very beautiful but also very dangerous. It's very warping and even tragic to an extent where it seems like she's just completely obsessed with him to a more fantasy extent, to a more complete admiration effect, right? Just seeing the praise that she gives Zeke is rather interesting and I thought it was beautifully captured. The first couple of panels of her were just incredible, not to mention the extremely warped face of her persona kind of standing behind Armin, which I thought was great. In terms of like getting things moving and kind of pushing in uh, more situations and more ideas, uh, I think Armin is the biggest one throughout this chapter. Armin, uh, I think for everyone that reads Attack on Titan or watches it, uh, I think people realize that he is, if not the most important character within the story. He has a lot of uh, symbolic meaning behind him. He has a lot of weight behind him, a lot of character development. He's extremely intelligent. Uh, as much as he is a dangerous threat to Marley specifically, as you know, being a very intelligent strategic person his ideology is very pure he's a very trusting character and i think he is the biggest segue point to help us as readers or viewers understand Aaron a little bit more obviously we know that Aaron has something else in plan the euthanasia plan that zeke wants and that ideology surrounding it is a complete contradiction to zeke's kind of mental state to an extent but if we apply that same plan the euthanasia plan to Aaron, it completely contradicts everything that Aaron wants which is freedom right and this chapter really does showcase heavily the future of children like children are the future they are the freedom they will push us forward into a better world a new age Armin specifically is that segue to help us I guess have a bit more faith in Aaron if it's not there already it's kind of depends on how you personally see Aaron and how you kind of want to justify his actions up to this point uh, for me it's something along the lines of like like Aaron's doing something that no one else would have dared to do. He's gaining all of this hatred, gaining all of this power because it is the only way possible to kind of break the original foundation, circle of hatred, this continuous cycle of fear and manipulation and torture and all out warfare can be broken if someone steps up to the plate and destroys everything. Aaron has been the only person willing to do this. He has a, a idea on how to stop absolutely everything he has the power now to do so mentally i think he's perfectly in the right place to an extent right there's probably mishaps within there obviously cracks in the whole picture but this seemingly is the only way to do it someone has to take the blame someone has to take the fall for mankind for paradise and for mali to continue forward into a more potential hopefully uh, peaceful nature within the future with us being unknown to aaron's plan wrapping in armin and believing in aaron also makes us believe in Aaron. Like, I believe in Armin that believes in Aaron. And I think that's a really good step in starting to showcase Aaron's true motive, because it's about time we figure out what he's actually doing. Not giving us the full picture, but I think Armin knows specifically what's up. I think just from the showcase and the flashback 
Alex and his interaction with Mikasa, I think Armin knows exactly what Eren's doing, without a doubt. I also do think he knows the fate of Eren at this point, which, if that's the case, it doesn't look all too good. Eren potentially dying or sacrificing himself or, you know, putting himself in that position where death is a very ominous thing or a very certified thing because of so much hatred that he has gathered, because of the threat that he poses to literally the entire world at this point. I think Armin at this point knows that Eren cannot continue living after this entire altercation, which would make a lot of sense on why he kind of held back his thoughts in terms of talking to Mikasa, as at this point she's kind of standing into the spotlight as a character that's branching out on her own. Own. She's no longer under the ideology of potentially uh, being attracted to Eren or forced to do stuff for Eren because of her Ackerman bloodline. The idea is still kind of stuck in her head, but Armin reassured that that's not true. And I think this is a very big step for her character, which I wouldn't be surprised if we get a lot more spotlight with her, potentially a lot of interactions with her and Eren, or at least the Attack Titan specifically. So with everyone kind of being released, Armin kind of persuading everyone that Eren has something up his sleeve. Like, he's not part of the euthanasia plan. There's something else that he wants to do. Everyone still has this hatred towards Eren, but they are slowly starting to understand what he's doing. He's definitely building up for a more emotional goodbye. As you can see, there's a lot of people that hate Eren, but still have these feelings of like, you know, I can't let him kick the bucket until I beat him up or until I cast him out or something like that. So there's still a lot of hatred there, but they're realizing what Eren's doing is benevolent past himself and everyone else. His ideology at the moment is not as warped as skewered as Zeke. You know, the euthanasia plan is something not in Eren's vocabulary, so there's something else here. And Armin is the closest person to figuring it out because of his connection and bond with Eren. And I think that's a beautiful thing, a beautiful showcase within this chapter. We get the information, we also get this emotional connection, we get Mikasa kind of branching out on her own two feet, and it seems very emotional. I feel like Isayama is secretly building up these red flags, like a lot of these characters could kick the bucket very soon, or at least a emotional goodbye to Eren, if that is the way it's kind of going. A really good showcase of child warriors is uh, Gabby and Falco. I think I've expressed my love for Gabby at this point in terms of her character. I feel like she's a very tragic showcase of Marley's manipulation, how they warp and somewhat even idolize their children to become these extremely powerful child warriors. For her to kind of have this self-reflection, to see the family that took them in while they were on Paradise trying to hide from everything, seeing that one child that hated Gabby and Falco and saying, that we should just kill them. I think that definitely hit a very strong point for her. It hit close to home. I feel like that made her self-reflect on her own ideology and how Marley has done exactly that to her and Falco and these other children that are out there. For her age and the experiences that she's gone through, this is a very big stepping point because not only does it seem like we're dismantling the warping and manipulation of Marley's children, which is a very big step in slowly getting rid of Marley, obviously, this also does put Gabby into the spotlight specifically. With Gabby's little trio, with Colt, uh, Falco by her side, they make a very strong team. And I say this very weirdly because of a couple of different things. One, Colt has a single Thunder Spear. And then secondly, Gabby's very determined to potentially get a Titan form. But her idea towards Eldians now is that of understanding. She understands the Eldian people. She doesn't see them as devils anymore, which is honestly incredible to see. It's so much growth there in this chapter. Falco, unfortunately, has ingested Zeke's spinal fluid, so at any moment that Zeke kind of roars, he will be turned into a titan. The fate between them is very strong, and they're probably going to have a lot of impact uh, onto the kind of upcoming chapters, which is great. With Falco potentially meeting Zeke and stopping him from roaring, with Gabby potentially gaining some sort of titan shifting ability, uh, and Colt with the Thunder Spear, anything is kind of optional at this point. Which then leads into the more ominous side of the chapter, the finale of it, regarding Zeke, uh, Peak, and Eren. So at this point, the Armored Titan and the Jaw Titan have been obliterated over and over again. They just completely get destroyed by Zeke at this point. Eren's slowly kind of building up and gaining a lot more energy after the damage that he took, so he's slowly making his way towards Zeke. Zeke has a very tunnel vision moment, where obviously his biggest issue was Peak, right? And he tries to attack her and she scurries off over the building because she has this titan rail or this massive sniper rifle whatever you want to call it uh, on her back which will completely obliterate a titan right but it has to be very precise which is 
you know, the importance for it. I think he himself, as much as he was kind of occupied with uh, taking out the Armored Titan and taking out the Jaw Titan again and helping Eren specifically, he completely misjudged the Peak situation, which I get it, this is warfare, but I also do think his brotherly love got in his way. He's seen Peak kind of all over the place at this point, you know, completely destroyed and even showed a lot of respect towards her and admiration, but completely glossed over the fact that it could have been a ploy or she could have detached from it and it could have been set up. I guess it's kind of hard for Zeke to think about that potential play in the moment, that bluff, but as you can see, it cost him almost his life and it could have cost him his life. They managed to cut a good portion of his body through the Titan. He then falls off the wall and is immobilized for a little bit. Zeke was the only person uh, other than the troops, the very useless troops that were trying to take down Peak at that point. Zeke was the only person that could have certified a guaranteed victory if Peak was out of the picture. That railgun was extremely important. Even just leaving it there on its own is a very bad play. Zeke should have tried everything to destroy it because the only thing that could realistically destroy Titans instantly would have been that rifle. With that out of the picture, they'd only have to focus on the small troops, the airships, which Zeke was successfully taking down rather quickly, uh, as well as the Jaw Titan and the Armored Titan, which they kind of had under lock at that point. So we end off the chapter on a very ominous note. Zeke once again being very close to death, which is nothing new for us. We always see Zeke on the verge of death at this point, and I don't think he's going to be dead. However, this does kind of inlay a situation that I think Eren has to take a big stand for. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if by the time Eren got to Zeke, because they're on the same level now, if Eren actually just ate Zeke right out of the Titan. Now, I know that kind of sounds very odd, but if this is where Eren starts to activate his plan, this would be almost the best time to do it. Unless he wants to use the rumbling first, but that is also the other biggest thing. The, the rumbling effect which is activating all of the wall titans at this point, the very massive titans stuck in the wall, to completely abolish everything. Even though they don't realistically have to, I don't think, they kind of somewhat got everything under control to an extent until other people start to turn into titans or whatever. The rumbling will cause a mass destruction, not only on Paradise, but also on Marley. So that going down specifically is a kind of end all end all. There's no turning back from that. And activating that is kind of your last card to play. It's kind of one one or two options really. Eren gets to Zeke and uses the rumbling, or Eren gets to Zeke and eats him, which I think would be a big surprise for people. On top of that, they have to worry about the rifle again, so Eren has to fight a little bit more. They have to worry about Gabby and Falco and a lot of other things going on. Armin Mikasa, not to mention the hidden card. Up everyone's sleeve, there is a hidden card right now, and that is Levi. As much as this man has taken so much damage, watch him fly back over the wall, ready to absolutely obliterate everyone, right? He's going to beeline for Zeke, most likely. I don't think he has a hand or fingers. He's going to come back with some synthetic robotic stuff and completely obliterate everyone. Like, at this point, it's kind of what I'm expecting. This could all just be a ploy right now to make us think that Zeke and Eren's going to lose, but they eventually get the upper hand and then Levi comes back into the picture and then Hanji comes back into the picture and it's like, okay, that doesn't seem like much of a threat because it's only those two, but their collective mind minds together could make a very big dent against Zeke and Eren, and a very weakened version of them, to be fact. Honestly, just seeing Levi return with such desire and hatred to completely obliterate Zeke would be phenomenal. I think everyone's kind of waiting on the edge of their seats for that. All in all, I felt like this chapter was pretty good. It showcased a lot of different things, a lot of growth from a lot of different characters, a lot of characters accepting things and moving forward and trying to understand Eren's plan for us as readers is a very big thing right now. What does he want to do? What is he trying to do? How much of a sacrifice will it cost? And how much does Armin truly know? I am very excited to see where everything goes and only time will tell. With that being said, that is basically it. Let me know how you guys felt about the chapter. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Let me know. I'd like to hear your thoughts. But I'm actually going to end the video off here. Hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.